it's good to see everyone online and uh, hello. Um, today we are very happy to have Dr. Stefan Muliza to be our third OC3 webinar speaker. And I will first give a very short introduction before um, Stefan give his talk. So Dr. Stefan Muliza is a marine geologist and a senior scientist at the Center for Marine Environmental Sciences at the University of Bremen, where he also got his PhD degree. Uh, his main research interest is the role of past ocean circulation changes in the evolution of marine and terrestrial environments. Dr. Muliza has led several marine research expeditions and participated in various international proxy compilation efforts, including um, GLAMAP, APILOG, MARGO, PACE, and OC3. Um, in the framework of the German PELMOD project, he's currently working on the software tools to streamline the homogenization of marine proxy collections for the evaluation of climate model experiments. So with that, uh, I will pass the torch to Stefan. And Stefan, thank you very much for being the speaker today. Now all yours. Thank you very much, Ning, and uh, thanks for, for having me. I will share my uh, screen. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Very clearly. So hello, everybody. Um, uh, indeed, I, I would like to talk about um, data compilations um, that that I've done data compilations for for my entire career, and in the last years we have intensified this this task actually within uh, the Palmot project uh, and the and the Pages OC3 um, working group. And I would like to show you some some preliminary results um, from from these data compilations. I'm doing this work together with, with Michael Langner, who is actually programming um, all the software tools that, that we use in this, in this project. Um, yeah, why are we interested in, in sea surface temperature? Um, one of the main reasons is, of course, that the, the climate models that we use to project the future um, give us very different responses uh, to an increase in atmospheric CO2, and that's expressed by the equilibrium uh, climate or quantified by the equilibrium climate sensitivity. This graph here shows um, the, the climate sensitivity, the temperature response, so to say, of the model uh, models to uh, a doubling of the atmospheric CO2 for the PMIP-6 models. And you can see that they cover a, a broad range from values of, of 1.8 degrees Celsius here at the, the right end to very, very high sensitivities um, at the warm end uh, of, of uh, more than five degrees Celsius. There was also described here in a, in a paper last week in Nature here by Hausfather uh, where, they, where you can get more details on this problem. Um, and of course, we want to know what, what is the realistic range? Uh, what, what can we expect for the future? Uh, and particularly these this yellow uh, um, range of models uh, is much more sensitive uh, now in the PMIP six phase and than, than the models here in blue from the from the PMIP uh, five phase. Um, so we hope that that paleo can inform us a little bit um, where the the right range for the sensitivity is and. Later on, please keep that in mind. I will show here some results from the MPI ESM uh, model runs uh, with a coupled uh, model by um, Uwe Mikulajewicz um, over the last deglaciation. And this is rec actually here in the, in the middle of the uh, sensitivities of the um, PMAP5 uh, models. Um, so, so what can we, how can we reconstruct temperature uh, from the past? Of course, there's a, there's a number of methods. Um, I would like to focus a little bit more on, on oxygen isotopes um, because here we really have a huge database. And this is here already uh, from, from a compilation of core top data I, I, I did 20 years ago with, with Gavin Schmidt and, and, and with Claire Verbot, Howie Spiro and others um, for these mixed layer dwelling species where you can very nicely see how well they track sea surface temperatures. We have very high values here in polar latitudes in the in the Arctic and in the Southern Ocean. Um, and then we have the low values here in, in low latitudes. And you, for example, look at the at the Western warm pool. You can see the east-west asymmetries uh, of the of the eastern and western boundary currents, the Gulf Stream. So there's a lot of information in those data. Um, 
And of course, we want to use that for, for our paleo reconstructions and for data model uh, comparisons. Now, the problem is, of course, with delta O18 that it's not only dependent on temperature, it's also dependent on the delta O18 of seawater. So when you are in front of a river uh, or um, an iceberg where you have a lot of freshwater input and you put a lot of light uh, um, isotopes into, into the ocean, and that can, of course, lower the delta O18 um, of, of carbonate. The, the shells are picking that up. And on glacial interglacial time scales, um, ice volume is a, a major player. The waxing and waning of the ice sheet, of course, extracts uh, light uh, delta O18 from, from the ocean, and therefore the ocean gets heavier. Um, and, and that is something that we see um, in our forums. We know that the ice effect is on the order of, of, of one per mil. Um, we know that from delta O18 measurements at temperature insensitive sites, sites that have already uh, a temperature close to the freezing point today, you these uh, landmark papers by Laurent Laberie and others. We know that from pore fluids, uh, uh, although the error here has, has, has recently been uh, enlarged a little bit. And finally, from paired benthic magnesium, calcium, and delta O18 measurements, this all points into the same direction, an ice effect uh, of one per mil. So we have to take that into account um, when, we, when we reconstruct temperature from, um, from foraminifera. Unfortunately, there's also uh, a number of, of other factors um, that have an influence. Of course, we, we don't know exactly where our forums live. We have some, some rough idea, um, but there's of course vertical migration. There's, there's sediment mixing um, that acts like a low pass filter and we have vital effects, uh, effects during the shell formation that influence uh, the isotopic composition of the shell that lead to fractionation. I will ignore these effects for, for today. Um, um, what is the database for, uh, for Delta O18? Um, there's of course a huge database because uh, oxygen isotopes are also used for stratigraphy. And recently uh, with this international um, consortium here, we put together an atlas of raw data from inferral oxygen and carbon isotope ratios. This is accepted for, the, uh, for Earth system. Uh, science data. And this database already contains two, two, over 2,000 harmonized, meaning they have the same data structure, down cross stable isotope records, a lot of previously unpublished um, data. So I, I have really emptied um, my draws. Um, and about half of the cores here uh, also um, are associated with, with radiocarbon ages. We plan to, to const constantly update this, this data product because there's still a lot to add. I estimate that this is maybe two thirds or so um, of the available data. And so we, we hope that, uh, that to get people interested in this data product. And if you are interested uh, to join this group and maybe join the next iteration of the Atlas, uh, please um, drop me a note. This, this Atlas is already with um, available either from Pangea uh, or uh, you can directly install it with the software that we are using, Paleo Data View. Um, during the installation process, um, you can directly install also this, this database and directly use it with, with the software. Uh, from this, um, this database, I have uh, so far uh, constructed over 500 Delta O18 time series. Um, and of course, not, not every species, not every core is, is suitable for a global uh, data collection. Um, there's certainly more that can be added, but this is what I will show today. And then in, in addition to that, um, I will also show um, means generated from magnesium calcium temperatures, time series, because of course we want to compare Delta O18 and magnesium calcium, perhaps even remove the temperature effect uh, from, from Delta O18. As already mentioned, I uh, concentrated here on the mixed layer species, Uva buloides and, and Pachyderma. These are the, um, the, the most frequently used species actually for, for planktonics. Radiocarbon calibration was done with INCAL 20. And here we used uh, the local reservoir ages that we extracted from model runs that are uh, the basis for the marine uh, 20 um, uh, calibration curve. 
uh, H-modeling was done and the uncertainty assessment was done with uh, Bayesian H-modeling, the Bacon uh, script that is directly part of the Paleo Data View um, software tool. And then we interpolated the data uh, to a five degree grid for all time slices uh, using uh, the same method that is basically used in the, in the Levitus Atlas, which he uh, termed the iterative difference correction method um, from the World Ocean Atlas that we, that we all use. So in the end, this is a distribution of, of time series um, that is currently available, blue for temperature, uh, red for delta O18 of carbonate. Um, I, I need to mention that, of course, here in the, in the polar latitudes close to the Antarctic continental margin and in the Arctic Ocean, we don't have currently uh, magnesium calcium temperatures. Here I made the assumption, since these are mostly sea ice covered areas, uh, that there was no temperature change, that we had have a temperature of constant temperature of minus uh, 1.8 degrees Celsius. Um, and this is, of course, supported by the fact that these O18 records only have a one per mil change or something close to one per mil, which means that they are dominated by delta O18 of seawater and by the, by the ice effect. Um, for, for the global uh, mean, that, that doesn't make a big difference because these areas only cover about 3% of the total uh, ocean area. So uh, it will not have a big impact on the, on the conclusions. Um, yeah, we have developed two different um, software tools. Uh, one is Paleo Data View. This is really a combination of a database and a toolbox. So you can, you can just explore the data with a map interface. You can do quality control. Um, you can harmonize the, the metadata um, of, your, of your isotope data. And you can do edge modeling. And in the end, as output, uh, you can generate time series and time series ensembles. And you see one example here, uh, a delta O18 time series with the uncertainty margin um, and, and the mean of the ensemble. And this can be generated, of course, from Bacon uh, because Bacon produces um, yeah, any uh, number of, um, of, of down core H models within the uncertainty range. Um, we can save that and then load this into Paleo Data Map. And this is actually the, the counterpart um, that allows us to interpolate the data globally, where we can do the geospatial interpolation. We can then calculate area or volume means. We can visualize the data. Um, you can slide through time, for example, and you can produce animations. And here's, here's one example. This is an animation of the delta O18 of carbonate. Um, throughout time, starting at 23,000 years before presence, probably a little bit too, too small um, in, into the present. So you see how, uh, yeah, how the system evolves. I cannot go into the details here today, but I will later then show the mean of those, uh, of those maps here. So what, what do we get when we uh, interpolate globally the magnesium calcium temperatures? And here you see, um, time series over the last 23,000 years, it stops at 3,000 years before present because the, the data coverage is not sufficient for the last 3,000 years. But this is basically the global mean temperature that we get for, uh, for magnesium calcium. And as you can see, um, we have something like a two degree uh, temperature change relative to the global mean SST from the World Ocean Atlas 2009, if we average over, um, over the period of the last glacial maximum, which is usually defined from 23 to 19 kilo years before present. Um, if we compare that here with, uh, with some of the available estimates of this temperature change, you can see that we are right in the middle, a little bit higher than what, what climate proposed, um, I don't know, 40 years ago, um, but we are getting over time slightly closer to two degrees Celsius. Um, so how, how reliable is this estimate? Of course, uh, we have to ask, you know, does, it, does this make sense? Um, and what I, what I did is I compared this to uh, the, the mean ocean temperature changes that was reconstructed from ice cores, from noble gases and ice cores and published here by Bereiter and Nature 2017. This is the black curve here. Um, 
And you can see that although he has, of course, some higher frequency variability that I cannot reconstruct probably because uh, the, the cores are not resolved uh, that well or as well as ice cores, you can see that the timing is fairly, uh, fairly good, uh, that there's fairly good match both in the, uh, in the magnitude of the change and, and in the timing of the change. And as Breiter points out in his, in his paper, the mean ocean temperature is rather the upper limit of the sea surface temperature change because the ratio or the mean ocean temperature changes must be higher than the, than the sea surface temperature changes. This probably has to do with the fact that deep waters are derived from high latitudes and there you have polar amplification. So uh, you probably uh, have higher temperature variations in the deeper parts and he, uh, in this paper, he's giving this ratio here between SST and MOT from 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 based on, um, on eight model experiments over the last deglaciation. So this would suggest that, that this ratio is closer to 0 0.9, um, but it's very hard to get a, a larger temperature change than, than that. Um, how does this compare to Delta O18? And here in, in this uh, graph, you see in blue, uh, the global mean Delta O18 of carbonate. And this is of course, a combination of Delta O18 of seawater with a big, uh, yeah, with dominated by, by ice volume. In this case, probably two thirds of this, of this uh, record are, are, or this change are due to ice volume. And of course, the sea surface temperature. And, we see immediately that there is a lag, and this is of course expected because the ice sheets are a very slow responder. So we have this lag ice sheet response um, to, to, uh, to the deglaciation. Now, of course, what we can do now is we can remove the temperature effect from, from the Delta O18 of, of carbonate. And this is what I, I've shown here. Uh, the threat curve is now the residual, um, Delta O18 change, uh, the anomaly uh, over the last 23,000 years. And the first observation is that we actually get, almost get the one per mil that is suggested by so many other um, indicators. So this means that actually Delta O18 and magnesium calcium have recorded um, a very similar uh, temperature change. But what about the timing? And here, um, we can compare this actually with, with sea level. And this is what I've done here. Uh, so here you see uh, the global sea level record for the last uh, 23,000 years um, in comparison with the residual uh, Delta O18. And as you can see, the timing is also quite, quite good. This means that our, our approach, uh, our stratigraphic approach, at least on the global scale um, seems to work. Uh, very well. We even have these two, uh, yeah, these two periods where the sea level is changing very quickly, where we have a lot of meltwater addition into the ocean, meltwater spike 1A and, and 1B. We even see that in the, in the Delta O18 um, residual in this case. All right, so how does it compare to, to model experiments? And at the beginning, I, I raised this question, you know, how, how, how do models compare or the change over the last deglaciation? How does it compare with our data? This is uh, data that were provided here by Uwe Mikolajewicz from the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. This is actually um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, an ensemble of model experiments with slightly different uh, starting conditions with the coupled MPI, ESM, and, and PISM. So this is a completely coupled uh, ocean atmosphere ice sheet uh, model system. And as you can see, the, um, the magnitude of the temperature change is very well uh, yeah, represented by the, by the model, what we see in the data over the last deglaciation. Uh, but we have an absolute offset. The, the, the data are a little bit warmer then the model, this might be due to the to cold bias in the model or a slight warm bias in the, in the data or both. Um, but if we compare the anomaly that you can see here, then you can see that actually 
um, we get a quite good match between the model uh, and and the data. We even see this this two step deglaciation here with a slight pause in in the warming in the bubbling artery period and then a second warming here during the younger dryas phase. One thing that we don't see in the model is this cooling here during the last glacial maximum uh, to a minimum temperature around 19,000 years before present. Um, so what is the reason for that? Well, um, it's of course clear that, that the model is, is mainly responding to the radiative forcing and that's driven by the, by the greenhouse gases. Um, and when we compare the SST changes here to the, to the recent uh, CO2 um, time series here provided by Peter Kula, I think Peter is also here today, uh, then we also see this, this two-step deglaciation and we see how closely the data are related to, to atmospheric uh, CO2 and to the, to the radiative forcing. But that's of course not the case here for the last glacial maximum. We don't have a strong change in atmospheric CO2 from uh, during that time. But we are coming from, from Henry Stadio too. So from a period where we have a reduced uh, overturning. Um, so it might be possible that ocean circulation is playing a role for that. Um, and I also would like to, uh, to point out that the two phases where well, nearly the entire warming takes place are phases where the overturning, the Atlantic Meridional overturning is reduced. This is true during Heiner Stadio 1 and it's true for the Anger Dryas. And then in the Berlin Alarate, of course, we have a strong overturning. Um, so either uh, there's a direct relationship between warming and the, the, um, the speed of the warming uh, and the overturning or there's a relation to between the atmospheric or the, the atmospheric CO2 and, and the overturning, which we know uh, there is probably, or it might be both again. Now, but what about this, this cooling here during the last glacial maximum? Do we have any indication of a change in the overturning during uh, this cooling phase? And to, um, to test that, I would like to show you uh, Delta C13 data here from the core 9508 uh, five, that's a core I've actually taken by myself um, in 2005 of Northwest Africa. And this is located very closely to this glacial chemocline here. Um, this is here, the, the interpolated uh, distribution of Delta C13 in, in benthic foraminifera from 500 meter water depths to, um, to, to the bottom basically from the OC3 uh, project. And we see this, typical pattern here with this heavy and uh, nutrient depleted glacial North Atlantic intermediate water and then the, the counterpart here, the Antarctic bottom water from the, from the south. And this core is directly located here at the glacial chemocline um, close to 2000 meter water depth. So it's very sensitive to the amount of North Atlantic deep water production. So this is here the, the time series of, um, of uh, 9508 here on, on the bottom, Delta C13. Um, so this is basically a reflection of uh, the North Atlantic deep water ventilation. And you can immediately see, and here on top, you see the, uh, the global mean sea surface temperature. You can immediately see that this cooling here that we see during the LGM is accompanied by an increase in ventilation, an increase in North Atlantic deep water production, uh, probably with the peak right before uh, Heinrich uh, Stadial 1. So we have probably a very strong overturning during that time. And then uh, with the onset of Heinrich Stadial 1, uh, we get an AMOC slowdown and, and ventilation decreases. Then it increases again in the Berlin, we get a plateau here, um, decreases again, we get a warming uh, until we, we, we stabilize uh, the North Atlantic deep water production in the Holocene. So I think the, the question that we that we have to ask, and this is more, more also an outlook, uh, I think we need more, a better understanding of, of the, the distribution of heat in the ocean uh, during the deglaciation to test these, these hypotheses. Um, and there are already hints here from, uh, from, from the modeling world, for example, here from Kostov uh, models with a deeper and stronger overturning store more heat at intermediate water depths 
which delays the surface temperature response on multi-decadal timescales. On millennial timescales, a similar mechanism might be at work. When we increase um, the NADW um, production here, we might be able to store more heat in the ocean interior. Um, and, and therefore we get this, this cooling here, although we have no, no external, uh, no strong external forcing during, during that time. So to, to test those, those things, probably uh, we need more anthic magnesium calcium ratios. And that already brings me to my, uh, to my conclusions. Um, so, so we've seen that, um, that the glacial uh, near surface water temperature, and I'm talking about near surface water temperature because the forearms, of course, they live somewhere in the mixed layer, um, was not stable and between 1.7, 2.5 degree colder than the modern uh, world ocean atlas temperature. And this amount of, uh, of cooling or warming uh, does not support these extreme climate sensitivities of some of the PMIP models. But don't get me wrong, I think the, the, the sensitivity of the lower uh, sen sensitive models is already uh, bad enough. Um, we've also seen that the entire deglacial surface uh, ocean warming takes place during hungry stay one and the younger dryers, times of weak AMOC and increased atmospheric CO2. Um, there might also be a contribution uh, of the ocean here that the ocean is at those times is not able to, to buffer away so, so much of the heat uh, because it's more, more stratified. Um, and as I said, I think we need, we need an understanding of, of the heat budget of the ocean. Of the entire ocean and need more benthic uh, magnesium calcium uh, measurements. Um, this is of course also important for the future because uh, most or I think almost all uh, uh, IPCC models predict a decline of the overturning for the future and that might then as in the past accelerate uh, global warming. And yeah as I already mentioned I think we need further work uh, to understand the interactions between the state of the AMOC during the deglaciation and uh, the deep ocean heat, heat storage and stratification, meaning more benthic magnesium calcium. Now, as an outlook, of course, I would like also like to show you here the a, a little film that was generated with Paleo Data Map that shows the, the pages OC3 data or the evolution uh, of Delta C13 in the Atlantic. Of course, this needs much more work. We can nicely see here that this deep, uh, low Delta C13 water mass is eroded away during, uh, during Heinrich Stale 1. Perhaps this is partly the CO2 um, that we then find in the atmosphere during Heinrich Stale 1 until we get into the modern uh, circulation pattern with the deep uh, North Atlantic deep water formation that you see here. Um, so this is all work in progress, um, but I hope um, uh, that we can produce similar films and data sets for the other oceans in pages OC3. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan, for the very nice talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, maybe... Liz has a question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I saw people. Uh... No, yeah, let, let Andreas go first. <laughs> okay. okay. Hi, Stefan. This was a Hi, very nice talk. Very cool. Thank uh, you. <laughs> I, have a, I have a technical question. So the, the temperature um, maps and the extrapolation or the you know the mm -hmm. how did you derive the the global value from the from the individual cores? Yeah, can uh, you we, yes, I, I think I even have a slide for that. Um, so so what we use is this Levitos uh, interpolation method, iterative difference correction method. What what you basically do, you have your raw data here, um, then you you average everything that falls into a grid box. So with I, we use the five degree grid box. Then you calculate from that the, the zonal mean, the zonal average. And for the boxes that are empty, you use the zonal average as a first guess. And then you have uh, yeah, a loop 
where you go through every grid box and look within a, a search radius what the difference is between your first guess and uh, and and the observations for all the boxes where you have observations. And then you transfer this information to the analysis grid box that is that is shown in black here. Um, and you you have like four iterations in this case, and you decrease the, the search radius every time. And then finally you you can you can filter the data if you want, and then you have your global your global map. And then you, of course you can you can apply an area uh, weighting to, to the data and then produce your, your global mean. Is that, was that your, your question? So this is how we, how we do it for the surface. Uh, and for the, the profiles that I've shown, this is actually um, a different interpolation method. This is um, uh, inverse distance weighting that we used there to, to visualize the, the, the Delta C13 data. Was that your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, so in, in the end, then you 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 fill out the entire global surface. You don't yes. have any blank spots anymore. Yes, okay. correct. Thank you. Hi, Lise. Yeah, please ask your question, Lise. Yeah. Sure. Um. So um. You know, you were doing mostly global compilations, and I may have just not been paying very close attention. But could you break this down also into uh, latitudinal bands? Like, could we look at the Southern Ocean versus yes. the equatorial and pull that out? That okay? Absolutely. Cool. That's that that's the that's the purpose of uh, of this Paleo Data Map software that we haven't yet published. Mm -hmm. um, so here you 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 really have uh, a lot of buttons where you can say, for example, here on the right, uh, where you can just click okay, show me the time series for the Southern Ocean, and and show me the time series for the North Atlantic. Um, and, and things like that. This is exactly what we what we are doing in this in the software. Sure. So we, we really want to streamline this whole process from the raw data to the final data product, um, which has its pros and cons. On the one hand, uh, you have a very yeah very streamlined process. On the other hand, uh, you 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 have to put everything into the software, and then you have no flexibility anymore, right? So so that's but but it. I think for our purpose, that's that's fine. <laughs> oh, very uh, love. I've been watching you do this, and this is just really lovely stuff. I'm very excited to see this coming along. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. I think Peter has a has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Stefan. Really nice talk. Hi, Peter. Thanks. Actually, the the point where SST goes down from 23 mm -hmm. to let's say 17 or so. This is quite exciting, actually. This morning I looked at a paper by coincidence, which actually has this in the model, but not in the data from the Journey Group. I think it's Osman in Nature last year. So oh, okay. the temperature from, based on SST, so this is global mean surface temperature, but the data are only based on SST data. And the, in the data, it only goes up and in the uh, uh, model based interpretation, there is a minima as well. And I couldn't understand why it is. And now you have to say minima there in your data. Ah, that's, I have to look, I have to look that up. That's, that's very interesting. Which oh. means that, that the model is producing that based on the, on the, for, on some forcing. I mean, it is, of course, when it is, when it is really due to the AMOC, then it will be probably very hard for the model to reproduce that because it will be very hard to have that at the right location yeah. um yeah but in, what in worries series, me but... a little bit is i mean okay you have more data probably but the compilation of the journey paper there is magnesium calcium in as well and o18 so it's probably half of the data are the same more or less and the signal mm -hmm. is not so th this maybe needs a little bit of work to really understand why is the result different actually yeah i mean they they used an assimilation approach so they they come when they have been, when they produce this global time series uh, it's not just the data it's the data and and the model or it's a model yeah. taking the data data into account i think this is something different from from my approach here where I try to keep model and data really independent. Um, I think both, uh, both approaches are important because of course, you, when you look at the processes, for example, an assimilation approach might help you a lot, 
Um, but when you really want to test the model and, and, and say which model has the right sensitivity, then you probably want to keep your data separate from the, from the model, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a good, good hint. I will, I will look at that again. Yeah. 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 And Andreas, yeah, Andreas has another question. Um, just a Please. comment on this discussion. Um, as has been pointed out by uh, James Annan, that uh, the, the model they used in the data assimilation in the Tierney method is a very high sensitivity model. So uh, the, the assimilated global temperature estimate is, is drawn from the data towards that high sensitivity model. So that's, I think, what explains why they are colder than the data alone estimates. Yes, I think they, they get to something like 3.6 or so in the end. So the Tierney, uh, I think this is only based on proxies here, but the Tierney paper is at the high end of the, of the temperature changes, definitely. And the, the, the sensitive model might be um, one explanation, yes. Um, Stefan, so, so yeah. I have a quick question. Yes. So what do you think of uh, the change of uh, seasonality? Uh, you know, the, the role of seasonality in the glacial interglacial temperature. Yes, this is actually a question I have expected because it's, it's of course a fair question. Um, and uh, I think actually it might play a role, but it, it only plays a very, a very small role. Um, what you see here is, is actually um, the weighted uh, temperature from uh, sediment traps over latitude here. Uh, look at Ruba, for example. And, and when, you, when you calculate the weighted, the flux weighted uh, temperature, you see that they all fall into a band of plus minus one degree Celsius. And for me, this looks very randomly distributed. That changes as soon as you get to the limits of the distribution. So when you are um, at, at the edges of the habitat, so to say, um, then you get a, a very strong deviation towards uh, their preferred habitat. Then they go to the summer, to the warm temperatures. Um, but in the tropics, uh, this is very close to the annual mean, what, what you see here. Um, and of course, in our compilation, we have different species. So we have uh, Buloides and Ruber in the same uh, grid box. So when there are deviations, um, they will probably be to some extent average out, not completely, but uh, I, th I think it is very close to the annual mean. Um, the deviations are small, but maybe significant. This is something we have to, we have to look at. And that all is also of course true for the, for the vertical uh, migration, uh, but I don't think it's a, it's a dominant uh, factor, okay. but it still yeah. might, be, might be a factor, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um... Maybe a second question for the for the for the paleo data map. That's, yeah. a, that's a software that I think that's very cool. And uh, will, will, is it linked to paleo data view or it's an, a totally uh, independent software? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. In the in the in the beginning, when we when we designed this this project, the idea was to to integrate paleo data map into paleo data view to make it a subroutine. Um, but meanwhile, it, it's, it's such a big software that, that we feel that it doesn't make sense, that it, it, it probably makes more sense to, to keep this as, as an isolated um, software. Uh, we, we may still have uh, a command in Palio Data View or a, a menu item where we can call the software, but it's then starting really on its own. So. And we may also distribute this in, in one package, um, but at the moment, I, I think we will keep this as an individual software because Paleo Data View is already so uh, has so many functions that it's 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 getting confusing, and, and this is not what we wanted. So it's so probably better to separate both of them into different software products. It also makes okay. the the maintenance much easier uh, because. You always have to otherwise you have to you have to maintain a very big uh, software package with more uh, potential for bugs and, and failures so that's that's our experience okay i see thank you um uh any more questions yeah okay uh, if if not i think
Uh, we will thank Stefan again, and uh, thank you very much for this very informative talk. And uh, yeah, and uh, we, I will send out emails about later uh, of these three webinars, and uh, hopefully to see you again later. Yeah. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming.